thanks. Thanks and good morning. I feel a bit like the accidental tourist. Um, you know, this, uh, this year is the 40th anniversary of uh, Intel Corporation and we've been, uh, we've been celebrating the anniversary all throughout the, throughout the year. Uh, and during, um, during the summer, we, uh, we actually had an internal uh, project where we interviewed a number of senior executives and, and senior technologists um, and asked them to forecast the next 40 years. Uh, and, you know, my turn came up and, uh, uh, you know, I said, well, gee, the obvious organizing idea for, uh, you know, for the talk should be the singularity. So I, you know, made my, my short vid video and, and talked about uh, Ray's work and, uh, and the notion of the, the singularity. Uh, and it turned out to be incredibly popular um, in the, you know, in the company. People really like this idea of looking out, you know, very far into the future and imagining uh, how the accelerating pace of technology was likely to, to change things. And then it came time to uh, start planning um, my keynote. Uh, which I do every year. I do a research and technology keynote at the Intel Developer Forum. And again, we thought the, the singularity would provide a very nice, um, you know, sort of organizing uh, idea. And, uh, and we, we built the keynote around that. And the response was just unbelievable. Uh, of, the, of the 10 years of the Intel Developer Forum, we're probably talking about, you know, 50, 60 keynotes over that period of time. Uh, the keynote on the singularity by far received the, the widest coverage in the media, uh, was the most popular uh, one we'd ever done, and you know, my inbox was filled for weeks uh, with messages, uh, both pro and con, uh, with respect to the singularity. <laughs> so, um, somewhat accidentally, uh, you know, I, uh, my name got associated with this, with this notion. Uh, I have to admit, I'm, I'm a total amateur when it comes to the singularity compared to all, probably almost anyone in this room. Uh, but um, you might think of me as, you know, in some way responsible for the trench warfare uh, that takes place to drive these technologies uh, forward. So what I'd like to do is, um, is take um, my few minutes this morning and, um, and show you how uh, we're trying to, uh, to take concepts like Moore's Law and, and apply them more broadly to, sort of, to bring the benefits of uh, this notion of accelerating returns uh, to a wider range of, of technologies. Uh, a number of which, or perhaps all of which, are going to be, are, you know, are going to be very important uh, in bringing us to that uh, point in the in the future where uh, machine intelligence and human uh, intelligence uh, begin to touch. So, uh, you know, Moore's law has been around for uh, well, at least as long as Intel's been uh, been around. In fact, the ideas even predate the formation of the uh, the formation of the of the company. Uh, Gordon Moore uh, once asked Carver Mead at Caltech, you know, sort of what are, what are the limits of, um, of MOS technology, uh, metal oxide semiconductor technology. And, uh, you know, Carver did a study along with uh, several of his students and, you know, predicted that, you know, we could easily get to one micron devices and, you know, later on uh, we talked about tenth, uh, one tenth micron devices, 100 nanometer devices. Uh, and today, you know, we're, we're manufacturing in, in very high volumes uh, devices with uh, critical dimensions on the order of uh, 45 nanometers, and we've demonstrated 32 nanometers. So, uh, you know, we've traversed a you know, tremendous uh, range of, um, of feature sizes and over the, the last four decades, and as a result, we're now building single chips that contain uh, billions of, of transistors and uh, are well on our way to tens of billions of transistors. Um, all of that has been based around this notion of silicon CMOS VLSI. Uh, this one transistor design, uh, device architecture as we call it, uh, has been with us for, for 40 years and it's, it's really become synonymous with Moore's Law. When you say Moore's Law, you're, you're talking about um, CMOS VLSI. Um, it's, such a, it's such a powerful idea, as, as you well know, that um, you know, we began some years ago to uh, look at ways to take, um, to take the applicability 
of, of the CMOS VLSI technology beyond just building compute and memory uh, devices. And some of the areas that, uh, that we've moved into over that period of time uh, are things like silicon photonics, and I'll give you an example of how we're using CMOS VLSI technology to control and manipulate uh, light uh, on chip, essentially using the same high volume manufacturing technologies. Um, I want to talk about radios because we don't often think about radios as, as being digital devices. The fact that you can, uh, you know, tune your, um, uh, your, uh, your radio at home, you know, with, uh, with a digital dial doesn't mean the internal electronics are actually operating in the digital domain. Uh, but we'll talk about how you can actually build radios that are entirely digital. That's important because by, by bringing them into the digital domain, um, we're, uh, we're in a position to take full advantage of uh, the laws of accelerating returns, and I'll say more about that. Something relatively new for us is silicon biosensors. Again, how we can take that same technology and actually use it uh, to examine uh, and manipulate uh, biomolecules. And again, uh, leverage the technology, be able to scale up uh, to very large numbers of sensor uh, nodes in a, in a device and look at the human genome, look at proteins, uh, examine uh, viruses, uh, and so forth. And finally, I think just to kind of tease you uh, a bit about some of the possibilities that lie um, on the road ahead, I want to talk about uh, programmable matter and, um, you know, and where we think that might take us and, you know, hopefully someday you'll have a slab of programmable matter in your pocket. Uh, which will shape shift to become your cell phone or your pocket display or uh, music player, what, um, what have you. So I want to start uh, with a core technology. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but uh, I think it's important to understand it. It's important, I think, it, it poses a very interesting question, and hopefully you can ponder this during the, during the summit. Um, let me bring up the laser here so I can focus your attention right over here. Um, you know, the, in the, in the singularity debate, there's, there's sort of this issue of, well, um, you know, what if these, uh, you know, these exponentially advancing technologies, you know, hit a wall? And, you know, would that suddenly bring the notion of singularity to, uh, to an end? Um, and it turns out, after this big buildup of silicon uh, CMOS technology, that uh, we, in fact, did hit a wall. And were it not for the break you, breakthrough you see illustrated here, um, the continued scaling of uh, silicon CMOS uh, would be in its end stage uh, right now. Uh, we reached the point uh, with classic silicon gate technology where we could not thin the gate material um, anymore without uh, causing significant increases in uh, electrical leakage, and that leakage translates into heat, uh, and the heat ultimately limits the performance of the, of the device. So, uh, as I've told uh, a number of journalists over the last uh, year or two, uh, as we began to talk about uh, this particular advancement, uh, in some sense, for Silicon Gate CMOS, Moore's Law ended last year. Uh, so, you know, one of the founding uh, uh, laws of accelerating returns actually did hit a wall uh, because of this, this issue uh, surrounding the gate dielectric. Uh, but we have a lot of smart people at, uh, at Intel, and they were able to essentially reinvent um, the CMOS transistor using a new material stack up, which consisted of a, of a hafnium-based uh, gate oxide material and um, a metal uh, stack up replacing the, the silicon uh, gate, which had been the mainstay of the industry for many uh, for many years. So uh, this is what we call high K metal gate technology. Uh, high K refers to uh, the uh, improved dielectric properties of the, of the hafnium gate oxide. And the metal gate was required because hafnium, uh, the hafnium oxide was not chemically compatible with uh, silicon uh, gate. Now, I think um, of equal importance was the fact that we actually passed right through that barrier uh, without any sort of lag or misstep or, or delay or manufacturing ramp problems or anything of the kind. So, you know, if the average person on the street 
Uh, you know, they're just more transistors, and they're better transistors, and they're smaller transistors, and, you know, and Moore's Law continues. Uh, which brings into question, you know, how do you define Moore's Law? You know, is it Moore's Law for silicon gate? Is there a new Moore's Law for uh, high K metal gate? Exactly what do we mean when we say Moore's Law? I'll just leave that as, a, as an interesting question. Um, it turns out that, um, that this transition to high K metal gate um, is just the beginning of what's going to be a very active period in the, um, in the evolution of transistor technology. The next step, uh, and really the, the, the point here, is, um, whoops, wrong button. Sorry, I'm trying to get my laser up here. Um, are these vertical uh, devices called FinFET, we call them Trigate um, devices at Intel. But uh, what I hope you can discern here from the, from the um, SEM shot is this is now the, the gate. This is the conducting channel of the transistor, and it's sitting on the surface of a silicon wafer. So these are surface devices, and that's the next important evolutionary step in, in this technology. Still high-K metal gate technology, technology, but built on the surface. The conduction channel in a bulk device, such as the current 45 nanometer technology from Intel, is actually right here at the surface of the, of the bulk silicon wafer. So a dramatic change in trans transistor architecture from the bulk to the surface. And beyond that, once you're sort of up on the surface, then you can think about using materials um, you know, that, are, that are quite different um, than the sorts of materials we use today. And here's an example of what we call a 3.5 uh, transistor. These refer to the location of these elements on the periodic table. But there's a 3.5 transistor. Um, 3.5 materials have very high electron mobilities, at least in the end type. Uh, devices, which leads to improved electrical performance. You can operate them at very low voltages, um, which uh, improves uh, performance and, and, lowers, uh, and lowers power. Um, and so, you know, this collection of technologies I've illustrated here uh, really, uh, to us, appears to provide, uh, you know, another eight to ten years of, uh, of solid uh, production-worthy uh, semiconductor uh, technology. And it's interesting in that at almost any point in, in the last 40 years, if you had asked uh, someone from Intel, you know, what's the future of Moore's Law, they would have said, well, we can look at about eight to 10 years. That's been relatively constant for the last 40 years that we always have about, um, you know, a 10-year uh, time horizon on the technology. Uh, but it takes a long time to bring these technologies to production. The first high-K metal gate transistor, as I recall, was fabricated in about 2000 uh, and didn't go into production until 2006. So, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to start looking further ahead. And, and we are looking out beyond 2020 now. Um, and the interesting development here is that um, we're even looking beyond the use of, of electronic charge as the... Uh, as the primary state variable uh, for these, uh, these devices. We're looking at other quantum effects like spin uh, and building spin transistors. There's a lot of interest in magnetic and electromagnetic uh, devices. So it's very likely when we begin to approach another set of limits, as we did with silicon gate uh, technology, uh, that in fact the, the underlying quantum mechanism will be quite different. Uh, we're even looking at, at molecular uh, transistors, if you will. Here's some illustrations uh, of them, uh, but it's way too early to start, you know, selecting among these. So, so lots of active work, primarily in the in the academic community, uh, looking at device technology beyond 2020. All right. So I mentioned uh, photonics. Let me just give you, you know, quickly, kind of the the you know the the issue here. Um, you know, just as we um, began to hit that wall with silicon gate uh, transistor, we've also begun to hit a wall in terms of our ability to move electrons um, at very high speed uh, across the chip and, and between, uh, between chips. Uh, there are just all sorts of uh, electrical effects that, that come into play at, the, at these very high operating frequencies. When you're in the, uh, the 10 to 20 gigahertz uh, regime, as we are routinely now uh, on these devices, uh, the electrons just don't want to go very fast, and it becomes very difficult to, uh, to propagate a high-quality signal across the, across the chip. 
So that motivated our interest in, in using photons as opposed to electrons to, uh, to communicate, again, uh, across the chip and, and between the chip. But um, historically, um, optical communication has been very expensive. It doesn't bother you to spend a couple of thousand dollars on a laser uh, and, a, and a photo detector if you're going to transmit um, you know, video uh, over you know, 100 kilometers of, of fiber optic cable. But uh, we can't afford to put a thousand dollar laser inside of, of every one of these chips. So um, we embarked on, a, on an effort, again, uh, beginning early this decade, um, to see if we could take the CMOS technology and, and use it to both generate and, uh, and detect uh, light and do so in an extremely low cost fashion so that you know, putting a laser down or putting a detector down on chip uh, would be of, of little concern from a cost perspective. And um, I think we've, we've been extraordinarily successful. This is um, an edge-on view of our second generation hybrid silicon uh, laser. Um, so you're seeing these are individual six milliwatt uh, lasers. I don't know what the power level is uh, on the laser in here, but this is my laser, uh, and that's a five milliwatt laser. So these are really powerful lasers, but they're incredibly tiny. Uh, here's, the, you know, here's the layout view of it. The laser is right here. Um, and what you see here at the, at the tapered ends is something called a Bragg grating. So we're actually able to monolithically construct the reflective ends of the laser cavity um, and, and pattern the entire laser just as we would build more or less a regular transistor, except we're building, a, we're building an optical uh, device here. And we have exquisite control over the frequency uh, at which the laser operates. So uh, in some future communication system, each one of those lasers might be at a slightly different uh, operating frequency, and then they could be easily multiplexed onto a single fiber and demultiplexed. So, you know, having terabits per second of communication off of a single chip, uh, we think is well within our capability uh, in the next four or five years. Uh, on the right here is a new um, 40 gigabit per second uh, photo detector. It uses a, a small plug of germanium. You see that small plug of germanium right there, and then here's the silicon waveguide. So the light is moving through here, and then the germanium um, performs the function of detecting the, the photon. So we can generate light, we can light, we can route light, and we can detect light using the same kind of technology that we use to build um, the microprocessors. Okay, so I mentioned radios uh, a moment ago. Let me just, uh, just talk a little bit. Um, about them. These are um, kind of simplified block diagrams of analog radios, the receiver chain on top and the transmission chain uh, on, the, on the bottom. There's a, there's a small amount of, um, of digital electronics in, in most of these radios. It tends to be in the baseband uh, section of the, of the radios, both um, in transmit uh, and receive. Um, but this is not a, a particularly um, appropriate radio from the point of view of the, of the singularity in that it is very difficult to scale um, the underlying electronics as um, our process technology uh, advances. And you sort of get stuck uh, with these analog um, IC technologies in that you just can't make the devices any smaller and still get them to operate. Uh, at the right um, at the right frequencies and behave in the in the proper fashion. So again, you know, starting around the early part of the decade, we said, well, what if we just got rid of um, all of that analog electronics and replaced it uh, with an entirely digital uh, solution? Uh, and many of our colleagues, of course, you know, told us we were nuts. Uh, they also told us we were nuts uh, when we said we were going to um, generate. Uh, light from silicon, uh, but we tend to ignore those folks and, and just press ahead, and more often than not, we find, uh, we find a successful path uh, through it. So we've been, um, we've been very active uh, in designing these, these all-digital radios. And the important, I think, that, you know, the takeaway besides this notion of making radios uh, consistent with the law of accelerating uh, returns is that um, not only do you get that nice property, but you get radios that are capable of acting more intelligently than any radio we know of today. Uh, you know, we, 
we exist in a world where every time another radio turns on, everybody else's radio performs more poorly. And, and that doesn't make any sense. The way it should work is every time somebody turns on another radio, everybody's radio gets better. That's how you want radio to work, but that's not the way it does today. And then we have this arcane notion of spectrum allocation where people pay billions of dollars for a few precious megahertz, you know, somewhere in the, um, you know, in the upper megahertz or low gigahertz part of the spectrum. What if radios were intelligent and could actually work together to find available pieces of the spectrum in short instances of, of time and actually help one another perform better. And that's the, that's the ultimate goal here. We haven't built uh, a completely scalable cognitive digital radio yet, uh, but we're making good progress. And, and here's some of the, the recently reported uh, work. Uh, we showed the, these front end modules, which are basically uh, the, the tuners, if you will, for the antennas. Um, this is the um, uh, this is a fractional end synthesizer, which is part of the of the mixer in the digital receiver. A very high performance sigma delta analog to digital converter. We've done the baseband. I just didn't have a die photo of it at uh, at hand. And recently, uh, the first part of the year, we um, we presented. Uh, the digital power amplifier at the Solid State Circuits Conf Conference up in San Francisco. Um, and, and this is a particularly interesting um, device because uh, it, it basically uses standard CMOS uh, inverters that are turned on and off relative to one another in, in, in both um, time and, um, and duration. And um, through a rather sophisticated um, digital modulation scheme, we essentially digitally construct uh, the analog RF uh, waveform. Uh, and, you know, our goal for 2009 is actually to build a complete digital uh, transceiver, both uh, the transmit and receive section of the, of the radios. This is so important because of the projected number of radios, you know, over the next decade. Numbers around 7 trillion pop up consistently in the literature. So we're, you know, we're talking about an average of 1,000 radios per person walking around the planet. And uh, that in itself is going to be an enormous challenge. And, and literally radio, the, ra the, the radios of the, of the future will look and act completely uh, differently than the ones we have uh, today. Um, Okay, so let me turn quickly uh, to this notion of silicon bio uh, sensors. Uh, I'd hope to sh show you a short video, but I don't think we were able to quite get the, uh, the links to, uh, to come together here. It was kind of a Windows Mac issue, as I understand it. Um, you're familiar with that, with that notion. But, um, but in our lab, we've been, um, you know, we've been actively working for uh, the last four or five years uh, on these silicon biosensors, and uh, you can literally think of it, maybe we'll, we'll just focus here for a moment, as a, as a specially designed transistor whose electrical properties um, are controlled by um, not simply the presence of or absence of uh, a molecule touching um, the gate connection, but by, in fact, the chemical structure of, uh, of that molecule, and using a mix of, you know, wet chemistry, reagent chemistry, um, and electrical sensing, uh, we're actually able to make out, and, you know, this is, this is the case of actually looking at, you know, at a, uh, a slice of the, of the genome, we're actually able to make out uh, what kind of material has, uh, has attached itself to the surface of, uh, of this transistor. And then, of course, we can have millions or billions of such transistors sitting on the, on the surface. So, uh, you know, a gene sequence using this kind of technology a few years hence will be a routine procedure in your doctor's office. You know, you'll be billed the proverbial hundred dollars to get your, your gene sequence. Um, and not only will we will be obviously able to tailor drug therapies, you know, to your particular genetic needs, um, but we'll have this incredible database, you know, hundreds of millions of, uh, of unique, uh, you know, uh, records of the, of the human genome, and, and that will be critically important for uh, health advances in the, in, the years, uh, in the years to come. So we actually refer to it, I don't know if you can read the tiny print here, but we call that a molecular gate, uh, where the, again, that particular molecule that's attached itself to that gate is actually altering the electrical characteristics of the transistor. 
Okay, pressing on. Uh, this is one of my favorites because it brings, it brings so many of these technologies uh, together in, in one way and, um, and I think really, uh, you know, really sort of, um, uh, you know, is, is, is sort of the ultimate expression of uh, these notions leading up to the, to the singularity. What if there existed um, a kind of material that, um, you know, that was um, intelligent, uh, self-organizing, self-powered, that uh, could be used in, in combinations with others of its, uh, of its kind to uh, assume arbitrary shapes and actually um, provide a, de a degree of locomotion or, or propulsion. And, and that's the idea behind programmable matter. Uh, we've actually uh, built some examples. These are, these are 2D CADMs. Uh, the CADM is short for a claytronics atom. We refer to this technology as, uh, as claytronics. It hasn't really stuck yet. Uh, maybe you'll come up with a better notion for this. But, uh, you know, here's a, here's a puddle of, uh, of CADMs in the future. Uh, we go through some 3D capture process, uh, and then uh, we use the CADMs to synthesize uh, that three-dimensional uh, structure. Obviously, they wouldn't be centimeter-scale CADMs, they'd be micron-scale uh, CADMs, but uh, that's the idea. Now let me show you, I do have a video illustrating this, sort of the kinds of things you can imagine uh, with real programmable matter. Oops, do we have sound? It's much better with the sound. I guess not. It always amuses me how sort of conventionally dressed these people are. They should be in Star Trek outfits or something like that. But, and here you see, uh, here you see this capability of, of programmable matter to change color. So every tiny particle um, can emit light at, um, at different frequencies. Um, you know, there's sort of a, a, you know, a pan of it here out of which comes uh, the, um, the actual object that, you know, was either captured uh, using 3D capture or was designed on a, on a 3D, um, 3D CAD uh, system. So that's, that's the potential. Uh, that's the future of programmable <coughs> matter and why we're so interested in, um, in claytronics. Um, here are a couple of, um, a couple of examples of the, of the current work uh, just to show you. These are millimeter scale <coughs> CADMs, so we've moved from centimeter scale CADMs to millimeter scale CADMs and, um, and these devices actually move along uh, the, the grid here. They're using electrostatic uh, propulsion uh, systems and so um, you know we're just uh, just experimenting with different uh, designs and, and different un underlying propulsion mechanisms. Just this year uh, we began our 3D millimeter scale development and, and part of that activity is the fraction is the fabrication of somebody said something yes okay so, um, uh, the fabrication of glass spheres that would actually contain the electronics module for a 3D millimeter scale CADM. And here's some examples of those spheres being formed. Those are the final spheres right down there. And what would sit inside of that, um, of that glass sphere uh, would be some stack up of electronics. So we'd, we'd combine this notion of the, the glass spheres uh, with uh, you know, the appropriate electrostatic um, uh, electrodes uh, formed on the surface of the glass sphere with the idea of 3D electronic packaging. So each one of these is a chip. They're interconnected in the vertical dimension using something like something called through silicon vias. These are actually uh, tiny holes uh, chemically etched in the, um, in the, uh, in the chip uh, that allow electrical connection in the vertical uh, direction. So even though um, an actual CADM uh, would be, let's say, a few hundred microns across. Uh, we could pack really an enormous amount of electronics capability inside of that tiny glass sphere, 
uh, and then assemble millions of those glass spheres and realize the, the image uh, of programmable matter you saw in the, in the previous slide. Okay, well, I think I managed to get through it here and leave time for, uh, for questions. So uh, our work at, at Intel uh, is really uh, focused on you know, driving the benefits of Moore's Law and extending this notion of the law of accelerating uh, returns uh, to an ever-widening uh, array of, uh, of technologies uh, and uh, you know, bringing the, the singularity the point of the singularity that much, um, that much closer uh, in time and hopefully making uh, a few dollars uh, in the process of doing that. So I thank you. I'll stop there and I'm happy to take your questions. One question. Okay. Do you think EUV lithography is going to be ready in time and if not, what do you think will follow double patterning immersion lithography? Uh, okay, so the question was, um, was about, um, about lithography. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're, of course, continuing to work on the, on the deep UV or, um, or, I'm sorry, extreme UV technology or the, you know, what other people call X-ray uh, lithography. In the, in the nearer term, um, we've actually uh, become quite adept at, um, at patterning um, uh, devices well below the wavelength of the light used, used for that patterning uh, using, uh, for lack of a better term, computational lithography techniques. So um, we, we actually do uh, an enormous amount of computing in order to generate the mass set. And the way to think about this is we we essentially introduce, um, through a computational process, the necessary corrections to, you know, to the final image. So we, um, we model the entire optical path and then, and then computationally correct for the aberrations and distortions that, um, uh, that are found in that, in that, optical, uh, that optical path. So we, we're currently not envisioning uh, lithography as you know uh, as representing uh, a, you know a major near-term uh, hurdle. It's you know it's still you know quite uh, you know quite complex um, a process and you know and one that requires really exquisite mathematics. But uh, we've become I think quite good at it um, over the last few years, and uh, and it's it's kept us uh, going in the face of um, limited optical resources. One more question. Okay, one more question. The, X, the X86 has been with us for a long time now. Do you think this architecture is going to carry us all the way through the singularity? <laughs> okay, Carl, yes. Um, uh, you know, uh, the instruction set wars seem to have, uh, seem to have ended quite some, some, some time ago. Uh, well, maybe they're, maybe they're coming back, but every time someone's predicted the imminent demise of x86, uh, it has survived them. So, uh, uh, so you're not going to get me uh, here on stage to suggest that it's time for a new instruction set interface. And I better, I better stop there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks.